Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Magda. I'm the Polonium Webinars project leader. And today we are extremely pleased to be organizing this webinar together with our strategic, strategic partner, NAVA, uh, National Agency for Academic Exchange in Poland. Polonium Foundation and NAVA have had a very fruitful partnership since the agency was founded in 2017. And considering that NAVA is driving the process of internationalization of Polish academic and research institutions, it is no surprise that uh, why they are such a valued partner for Polonium and why we really appreciate the support and opportunities for working together such as this one. If you are interested to find out uh, to find out more, uh, we were honored to have NAVA's director, Dr. Grażyna Żebrowska, as a guest speaker uh, at our Career Choices panel last year, and NAVA will also be present during our upcoming Science Polish Perspectives conference, including a comprehensive workshops about their grant, pro grant program. We will post links in the chat in case you are interested. Um, this webinar is a little bit different from our previous ones because we have four speakers. Uh, the sessions will be followed by a longer Q&A session at the end, but if you have any burning questions... Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm just... someone is writing on the screen. Uh, if, we if you have any burning questions after any of the talks, please, you can raise your hand or just type the questions in the chat. So after the talk, we can spare one to two minutes to ask these. And if they're not too burning, uh, you can just ask them on the longer Q&A session. Um, so our first speaker will be... Oh, let me just stop the annotation for the for others so we don't have more things on the screen. <laughs> okay, should be working. Uh, our first speaker will be Magdalena Filipovic, who is NAVA's representative coordinating the ULAM program. If you could share your screen, Magdalena. Uh, yeah, let me... I had some problems. I don't yeah, use usually the Zoom. Yeah, okay, it's <laughs> working now. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, hi. Uh, I would like to introduce myself because my name is Magdalena Kowalczyk. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I oh my god. No problem. Magdalena Kowalczyk. I'm. I'm I've made the typos. Oh, I'm really sorry. It's okay. And I am coordinator of Ulam program from the beginning. Ulam program was announced twice, 2019-2020, and now it's a third edition with small changes in regulation. I have 12 slides with information and I hope that this program will be a good option for someone of you. <laughs> uh, Ulam program allows to invite scientists and specialists to the Polish institutions of science and our universities. We can observe two ways of initiatives. Polish scientists invite somebody from other country to start or continue the cooperation, or foreign scientists find the information about our program, searches for institution and for supervisor, and applies. In both ways, an application is submitted by individual scientists. And the program allows to host scientists, both young doctors and experienced professors of any nationality, representing all fields of science. Previous editions were dedicated mainly to foreigners, but this time is also open for to Polish citizens. Eligible applicant has a doctoral degree, has not lived, studied, or worked uh, in Poland since at least June 2018. Applicant has possessed minimum three achievements from not earlier than 2016. And I will have, I will show you the separate slide with achievements. 
Applicant uh, submits invitation from the host institution confirming the willingness to host him or her in for the requested period and indicates the person responsible for coordination and for supporting the fellow. Visiting scientists can stay in Poland for six to 24 months and the visit can start no earlier than uh, January 2022 and no later than October 22. During the realization of the project, the period of stay outside to the, the host institution cannot be longer than 10% of the total duration of stay. 10% uh, applies to the absence which is not related to the projects, like uh, project like holidays or family reasons. Scientists receive a monthly scholarship, 10,000 zloty per month. It's about 2,400 euros. And also mobility allowance for the travel costs, visa or insurance. This year we have also special money for learning of Polish. And this is 5,000 zloty, of course, only for foreigners. Scientists may be accompanied by family and in case of disabled person, uh, she or he can arrive with uh, personal assistant and get money as for a spouse. There is no money for institution and no money for research like materials or conferences. As an agency, we only support the mobility of researchers and money for research or other expenses should be obtained from other resources. Usually, usually the super, supervisor supports fellow from his uh, own grant money. In this program, we transfer money uh, scholarship directly to the fellow's bank account. The visits may include completing a postdoctoral fellowship, conducting any scientific research, obtaining materials for research or scientific publication, but also collecting samples, analysis of data with Polish partners, or for example, working on unique equipment. Additionally to the scientific activities, fellow may have didactic classes at the host institution and the description of activity in the application in the proposal should include impact and benefits of stay for both the scientist, but also for our Polish institution. Application form includes also um, biography of applicant, publications, uh, research projects, or any awards. We ask also for doctoral diploma and invitation letter from the host in institution but we also require confirmation of employment that applicant is employed or was employed recently at university or any other research institution. The employment is not required for person who obtain a doctoral degree after uh, August 20, 2020. The applicant must present three achievements which meet this criteria. Publication in English in journals, in journals included in international databases like Scopus or others, or reviewed research monograph published in English and one or two chapters don't meet our requirements, or publication in English in reviewed materials from international conferences indexed, indexed in international databases. And the representatives of art studies should present a proof of presentation of their art work in a foreign institution or a distinction in international competition. All Polish institutions of science and higher education and all our uh, institutes of Polish Academy, Polish Academy of Sciences and all our universities can be the host institution in this 
program. If some university wants to host uh, a scientist, it must give him or her an uh, invitation letter, but other commitments of host are to supervise the progress of the scholarship, provide opinion on fellows' performance in required uh, reports, and provide administrative uh, support. No. Okay. All submitted applications are, of course, evaluated. This is eligibility check carried out by NAVA staff and merit-based evaluation performed by experts. This evaluation has three stages. Preselection is based on the applicant's achievements and scientific or academic activities. And after meeting, evaluation team recommends the proposals for the second stage. It's about 40% of all uh, submitted proposals. Next, we have evaluation by two external reviewers. Here you can see what kind of uh, criteria are judged by them. At the end, the evaluation team takes into the account uh, the opinions of two reviewers and assess the other criteria which were not evaluated during the first step preselection. And finally, evaluation team uh, prepare, prepares the ranking list with proposals uh, recommended for funding. Okay, here you can see on the slide what kind of applications were recommended for funding if we check the field of science. Of course, these data are proportional to the number of applications at the beginning, uh, submitted application in this edition. In natural sciences, which include a few separate disciplines, most applications were funded in biology and physics. In the first edition, 2019, we had 355 applications submitted and 70 were selected for funding, but finally some beneficiaries resigned. In the second edition, last year, we had 348 applications and 76 were selected for funding. This year, we also had some resignation because pandemic or other family reasons. We had also, uh, but we, this year we had also the standby list with 10 next names for recommended for funding. The success rate in both edition was about 20%. And now, now we have the next open call. The deadline for application is until June 15. The application can be submitted only online link to the system is in our announce announcement on the, our web page. The applicant can submit only one application per call, only, only with one host institution. And hopefully the results can, can be expected in November. I hope so. And one word uh, about the seal of excellence. Uh, last year we had a separate call for the people who received uh, seal of excellence certificate that means that they had very high score in the last edition of Marie Curie Action Individual Fellowship program but there was not enough money for all good proposals in this year both calls are connected and scientists who obtain such such certificate can apply with everyone else they must submit the same document documents which were evaluated by European Commission. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. The announcement of the call with all details in, is on our, our web page. And of course, if you have um, more detailed questions, you can send me email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Magdalena. Um, we have one question. Uh, oh, we have a couple of questions actually. The first one is uh, 
can this presentation be shared with the participants? Could we? Of course. Okay, so if we could please get the PowerPoint and then we will send send you all um, send you all the presentation after after the webinar. Thank you. And there is another question from Hanna. Uh, were there any applica applicants from the field of art? Oh, you know, I think we had two or uh, one, two maybe of them, but they didn't succeed. Okay, if you have any more questions to Magdalena, we will, um, we will ask them during our Q&A session. And now, um, please welcome Zehra Tashkin, who is a visiting professor at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań in the Scholarly Communication Research Group. She will tell us today about uh, research dreams and the funding programs that make these dreams come true. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, it's an honor for me, it's an honor for me to be here uh, and, ex and explain my Poland adventure. It's, it is really good uh, thing for me and I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, before the presentation, I want to tell something about myself. Uh, I am Zehra Tashkan and I am working as a, as, a, uh, as a visiting professor at Adam Mickiewicz University Scholarly Communication Research Group, thanks to NAVA Poland's ULAM program. I get my ULAM grant in 2019. Uh, I'm the, I am one of the first uh, awardees of this grant. Uh, I'm living in Poland, Poznan, for one and a half year and with my family. I have a son, 10 year old son and a husband and we are living in Poland together. And uh, before I came here, I was a, an assistant professor and then I get tenure in Turkey. I became an associate professor, but uh, I had a really good title here. I think the best title I ever had. It is Master of Rainbows. Uh, it is given by my uh, friends. Uh, in scholarly communication research group because of uh, the visualizations I made. I, I have any title here and this is me. If you wonder me, you can check my website or my Twitter account. My most of tweets are in Turkish. Sometimes I tweet in English, but rarely Polish. I cannot speak Polish, but I sometimes I try. <laughs> you can check it, uh, but that's me. Uh, if you wonder how it started for my project, uh, as you realize, I am a good Twitter user. I follow uh, academic Twitter accounts. But before this, I know Emmanuel Kuczynski because he is working on uh, the subject I work for. Uh, he get, then he gets a project called Evaluation Game in Academia, when I saw this, I had a uh, contact with him uh, to ask about the content of the project. But then I uh, saw this tweet uh, from Emmanuel Kuczynski and I uh, wrote a long email to him to ask what is the opportunities working in Poland and uh, what can I do? Uh, do? Is it possible to make my research dreams true in Poland? Uh, I asked many things and Emmanuel wrote me that we should make or arrange a Skype meeting and we can talk about everything uh, during the Skype meeting and we met in uh, two days and I asked for everything uh, starting from working in Poland is it enough to live with family in Poland because it is important to get enough budget to live in Poland so uh, my main concern was uh, is the budgets are enough. So uh, yes, it is more than enough. Uh, I can say it uh, easily. Um, I had a permanent job in Turkey uh, and I plan to write two year project and it means I can lose my permanent job in Turkey. So it's a risk. It was a risk for me. And this, this risk became true, I lost my permanent position in Turkey, but it's not a problem for me because uh, I know the risks uh, for these projects and 
I I would like to do it because I can see the opportunities behind this uh, proposal. Um, my other concerns is about family because my son, I have to, I had to find an international school for my son. Uh, I, I had many concerns. Uh, fortunately, it, it was before the pandemic, so uh, we arranged everything so quickly with the help of the research team. So uh, everything, all the questions of mine are uh, focusing on these issues, working in Poland, creating a new life, and moving to Poland, uh, and these are my main concerns. Then, after we met to Emmanuel, uh, I uh, I had two research idea, a research dream. I, I prefer to call them research dreams. I had two uh, different subjects for research. One is creating content-based citation analysis system. It um, it is my PhD dissertation subject. Uh, I'm working on information science, and most of my studies are uh, based on uh, creating new and responsible research evaluation systems and leaving the traditional metrics behind. And my main idea was uh, when I pre uh, start my PhD, uh, I plan to change something uh, on citation metrics and I start my Turkish dissertation. After I publish my dissertation in a prestigious journal in my field, I this makes some noise in my field and it gets really good attention from prestigious journals. They use my classification scheme and uh, I, I really would like to go behind, go uh, further and uh, this was, my research dream to make it for more languages. So I write, uh, I wrote this uh, project proposal uh, entitled Creating Content-Based Citation and System for English and for Polish. Um, and I submitted 23rd of April, I think. And I remember the day uh, the NAWA announced the, uh, the awardees. It was uh, on September. And I was running in the park, uh, in the park, and Emmanuel texted me, Congratu "Congratulations, you are the part of our team." And that that was really a perfect moment for me because I I, I really want to uh, conduct this project. So uh, I get this. This is the I think this is the perfect moment of my academic life to get this message. Uh, this is my first timeline. Uh, I submitted with my proposal, uh, and I'm al almost here now. Uh, everything on the schedule, fit in the schedule, everything is okay for me. Coronavirus cannot affect my studies. Uh, I, I think it's, it's interesting uh, because everything can, everything is affected from coronavirus, but not my uh, work because um, from November uh, 2019, I'm in a really perfect place to uh, for academically and also the socially. Uh, we worked together for the first five months without coronavirus, and we create we make really good brainstorming meetings, um, seminars, reading seminars. Uh, we had a small kitchen. We had great talks in lunch and breakfast. Uh, but after coronavirus came to the world, uh, we uh, adapted to online system. But it is not take it, it did not take too long. We turned back to the office because if you have child, you you can understand what I mean. It's impossible to work at home. Uh, we have a good building and fourth floor is for us, so it's okay to work at the office for us. And we are still uh, continue to working on uh, scientific studies. Uh, why I explain, why I tell something about social side if, if before uh, the academic side, because my main motivation channel is finding a good place uh, and without any 
concerns without any problems, without stress. Uh, this is my motivation channel. And I have this motivation uh, platform in Poland, in Poznan. And Poznan is really a great city. And if you ask me about the project, how this project is going, um, project is going well uh, in time. And preliminary findings published in Scientometrics, it is uh, one of the prestigious platform for my uh, discipline. And I also, I'm very happy to get open access opportunity provided by uh, Poland universities, uh, because in Turkey, we, we often cannot find um, enough fund for gold open, but uh, Scientometrics is a part of Springerling and Poland has kind of agreement with Springer and my publication uh, publications open access fee paid by Poland University agreement. So it, it's open access. This is a good opportunity for uh, accessing more audiences for your papers. Uh, and the final chapter about my project will be published in fall. Uh, I was invited to a PhD lecture in Adam Smith University. Uh, I plan to submit uh, two papers in until November about my project, the uh, Polish side and English language side. And after uh, my project ends, I plan to make a comparative study for uh, languages success rates for citation analysis. Um, these are things for my project, but I think um, when I first wrote, wrote my proposal, I thought that my two years will be just focused on my own project, nothing more. But it is not, it is beyond my dreams and expectations. Uh, I published three articles with Adam Mitchkiewicz University affiliation and they are not about my project. This is uh, free articles. And uh, I have four articles under review. Uh, before I came here, I follow some scholars all over the world, especially from Europe. And I read all the articles they publish. And now I can publish with them because Emma has really good network and I involved in some of his studies. Uh, so uh, I have a great network with the help of Ulan program. Um, I think this is one of the most important um, contributions to my academic uh, success, academic achievements, uh, but it is not the best uh, contribution. I will show you what is the best contribution, but uh, in one minute, I will show you. Uh, I have conference proceedings, keynote speaks, and invited speaks about everything, about my research field, research evaluation, and new types of research evaluations. But when I pre prepare this presentation, uh, I turn back to my proposal and check some pages of the proposal. Uh, I, I was surprised that I wrote this uh, sentence to my proposal. My dream is writing a proposal to ERC starting grants, and I think I can make it real during my postdoctoral project in Poland. Um, always I said that now Poland can uh, make your research dreams come true and can help to make your research dreams come true because I submit my ERC grant uh, two days ago. Um, this is my research dream and I make it possible uh, with the brainstorming meeting with my friends here. I know that the acceptance rates are so low, um, but it is worth, worth trying. I think uh, the, pro the host institution is in Turkey, but this is the collaborative project uh, proposal. It includes Poland, Turkey, and three more countries. I hope I can uh, follow the collaboration between Poland and Turkey uh, with this ERC grant. But if uh, I cannot get this grant, I believe that it will never end because it, I know how uh, everything is going well in Poland. So this is my story. If you want to apply for ULAM program. Um, I want to inform you about the opportunities provided by NAWA. So 
I hope you like it. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask for me. Thank you so much, Zehra, and good luck with the proposal of, of the application. You. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any burning questions. If there are any, if you can raise your hand or we'll just go to our next speaker, who is uh, Matthew Stevens, who now works at the Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun. And he will present um, his, his research on ethnicity, law, urban development and identity, a comparative study of medieval Wales and Prussia. Stage is yours, Matthew. And you're muted. So could you, if you could unmute yourself. You're still mute. Yes, okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how much time I've spent online in, in the last year, and I, I'm still muting myself. Oh. <laughs> Happens to all of us. Now we can hear you. Okay, uh, as, I, as I'd say in Wales, uh, um, and I, I would stress that uh, part of what has, has driven um, my desire to engage in this project with the Olam program is that I'm a historian of Wales, and Wales, while it's part of the United Kingdom, is actually a separate nation with a different language and a different history. And for that reason, it actually has quite a lot in common uh, with what is now North Poland, but used to be Prussia. Uh, and thus the title of the project that I'm following here on the Olam program, uh, ethnicity, Law, Urban Development and Identity, a Comparative Study of Wales and Prussia, because these are two places which have very particular histories of what we would call colonization in the Middle Ages. Now, I'm, I'm always worried that people don't know exactly where Wales is. Uh, people always seem to know that Scotland is the north part of the United Kingdom at the top, but they don't seem to know that Wales is this kind of little bit sticking out on the left. Uh, which is red in the left-hand picture here, uh, marked in the map, middle map, and that's a, a picture of the city and university on the right. So that's my, my work for the Welsh Tourism Board down there. Now, my kind of road to the Olam Fellowship is, is actually quite a long one. Uh, I undertook a PhD in Wales on the history of uh, towns in medieval Wales. And uh, at that time, like most PhD students, I was really just thinking about my own little world in, in Wales itself, my own little patch. But uh, as time went on, I, I had a, a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at Oxford and then worked as a researcher at the University of London. And as that came to an end, I had a bit of, of free time and a colleague there told me, you know, actually the, the history of, of, you know, medieval Prussia and what's now North Poland is, is really similar, you know, and you should be thinking bigger, you know, you should be thinking about broad comparisons between Wales and, uh, for example, Wales and Prussia. And this really got me thinking about a, a concept the concept that in fact, the, the history of medieval Wales and medieval Prussia are really similar. And that Wales was colonized by the English and Prussia was colonized uh, by uh, ethnically German people. And in both places it had similar social results. Uh, Wales is an interesting place because uh, in the middle ages when countries like England had a really strong sense of identity, uh, in Wales, we were still just a, a group of warring tribes, basically. And the same was true of Prussia uh, in what's now North Poland. And in both cases, when the English colonized Wales, where the, Prussia, the Germans colonized Prussia, that experience of being in contact with other people actually, in many ways, created a Welsh identity, uh, or indeed a, a Prussian and eventually a German Prussian identity. So I, I had this concept in mind, and a colleague at London said, you, 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 know, you really must get in, in touch with this fellow at Nicholas Copernicus University in Poland, uh, Professor Roman Chaya. He's absolutely the, the kind of top scholar and looking at German towns in Prussia. And so all the way back in 2010, 
I came to Poland uh, to Copernicus for six months on a visiting scholarship uh, funded by the University of London. And at that time, I, I had a chance to sort of develop this concept uh, with Professor Chaya, and we discovered that, in fact, we had an awful lot in common. And so we stayed in touch over the years. And in 2016, um, we managed to get a, a Harmonia grant from the Narodowe Centrum Nauki, or the National Science Center in Poland, that allowed us to, to travel back and forth and to meet with a bigger group of scholars on this topic. And then eventually, uh, I was able to get a, a small grant, what we call a small grant in the United Kingdom from the British Academy, to do some, some preparatory research on the topic in Wales about the formation of national identity after English colonization. And it was only after we uh, put together all of that research and uh, had a couple of publications sort of laying the foundations that then I applied to the Olam scheme on the current project to look at ethnic law, urban development and identity. And so really it was, it was quite a long journey to reach uh, the moment when I arrived here in, in Poland to start our, our Olam project. And that, that was a really exciting moment for me. Uh, just to put things in, in perspective, uh, on the left is a map of Wales, and on the right is a map of old medieval Prussia. And uh, I've marked it out here so you, you could see really clearly where it is in relation to Lithuania, what's now Germany and Poland in the south. And they're, they're not quite the same size. Uh, Prussia on the right is obviously quite a bit bigger, but in both places, colonization meant, created about 100 towns in lands where there had been no towns at all. Oh, it's hard to believe, but in the uh, central Middle Ages, Wales and Prussia were two areas of Europe that were absolutely untouched in terms of towns. There were no towns there. But towns are the kind of main tool of, of colonization. And when people came from England to Wales or from Germany to Prussia, they arrived in towns first. And so they're kind of nodes of cultural transmission, nodes of, of immigration. Now, this is a slide with way too much information. Uh, but I'll just give you a, a, a summary of just a, a couple of things that were really in the front of our minds when we were starting our project. And this is that uh, the population isn't completely separate or isn't completely different. Uh, about 300,000 people lived in Wales and about 480,000 people in Prussia. And by the end of the Middle Ages, because of the colonization, uh, in Wales, you had a, an English minority of about a quarter. Uh, and in Prussia, you had a German minority of about 40%. And so you have a big minority group of colonists who've come and created about 100 towns in each place. And in the beginning, there are very few native Welsh or Prussians in those towns. Uh, but by the end of the Middle Ages, what you see is, is the local native population coming in, Welsh people living in these English colonial towns and non-Germans living in these uh, German colonial towns. And I'd sort of stress there's a really similar chronology between the two places. The English conquer Wales from about 1200. The Germans move into Prussia at about 1230. Uh, both places see afterwards a major kind of mini revolution where the locals try and push them out uh, and at the end of the middle ages in both places there's a e uh, big economic crisis and then uh, Wales is joined officially with England and ultimately Poland would annex uh, Prussia. So uh, we looked at this kind of similar pattern of events and we said okay what's the the social consequences what are the social consequences of this colonization of these places the building of all of these towns in, in wales and prussia and and can we connect the kind of emergence of a welsh identity or the emergence of a of a, a german prussian identity in prussia can we connect that with the process of 
colonization, the process of locals and outsiders mi mixing, getting to know each other, and in fact, sort of realizing that they're quite different from one another. And so we, we looked at this history and we realized actually it maps really well onto what a psychologist calls social identity theory. And that's something that was uh, invented by uh, uh, Henri Tajfal. And uh, don't be uh, fooled by the very sort of French looking Henri at the beginning. Uh, he's actually uh, a native of Poland from uh, Wrocław, uh, just 50 or 60 kilometers from where I am now. Uh, he was a Polish Jew who fled to Paris during the war. But he said, for all groups of humanity, there's a third, sort of three-step process by which you get to know each other. There's group labeling. So people don't really understand who they are until they're given a kind of collective label. And in Wales, these sort of warring tribes of Welsh people, when the English arrived, they were universally told, nope, you're different from us, you're Welsh. And a very similar thing happens in Prussia, where a kind of German elite come and build towns and they say, mm, you know, you're not German, you're not, you're not coming in here, basically. And, and that, again, forges a local identity. Uh, so that's the kind of step one labeling. And step two is, is that the, the group who's been given this label, whether it's Welsh or Prussian, they internalize it, they begin to identify with it. And so after that, you see a, a Welsh national rebellion in Wales, and you see a, a Prussian rebellion in Prussia. And in both places, the colonial English and German governments uh, respond by creating a bunch of security laws. You know, Welsh people or Prussian people may not carry weapons. They may not live in the towns. And in fact, this even uh, emphasizes the difference between the local and the incomer. And it actually builds up even more group identities. And finally, as a last step, we see people really internalize these labels and they begin to compete between groups. And we can really see this at the end of the Middle Ages, both in Wales and in Prussia, where it's no longer the government imposing divisions between the groups based on these labels, but in fact, it's ordinary persons. Uh, if you were here in Torun, for example, in 1480, the, the Carpenters Guild, for example, and or the Butchers Guild, they both uh, invent new rules that say, anyone who is not a German cannot be part of our guild. They cannot participate in our trade. Uh, same thing in Wales, you, groups of Eng English, uh, English townspeople going to the king and saying, can we have a new uh, foundation document for our town that lets us throw out anyone who's not English? Uh, and so we really like, uh, we really set about to map social identity th theories, three stages onto the chronology of history in these two places on completely opposite sides of Europe. And the fact that it, it really neatly matches up in two completely different societies and two completely different parts of Europe is a really strong endorsement that, that this is a valid theory for interpreting how universally how we meet and identify ourselves as groups and internalize those identities. And it, that really speaks to the heart of, of so many modern European questions about, you know, how do we relate to each other? Uh, so the kind of big argument of the project was labeling and conflict can create group identity, but at the same time, there's always a countervailing trend of individuals not the whole group, but certain individuals moving in. So remember, I, I said at the beginning that over time, you do see more and more local Welsh or Prussians moving into these English or German colonial towns. And that happens even though there's the sort of big headline discrimination. Uh, I like this, this cartoon, which I think really sums up uh, social identity theory is that the, the process of each uh, collection of people uh, taking on a label and beginning to identify with that label of who they are effectively allows two different groups of people who fundamentally are the same, have the same concerns, the same desires. It allows them to effectively justify separating themselves. Okay.
So my experience for the Olam program uh, in undertaking this research has been a really positive one. The driver behind the program for me was, was collaboration to be able to come to Torah and to work with Professor Chaya, uh, Professor Krzysztof Kwiatkowski and others here. Uh, also to be able to use the unique resources available at Torah and there's a, a Baltic reading room in the copyright library here, which is the best single collection of uh, research materials on the German colonization of Prussia anywhere in the world. I think that's fair to say. Uh, it's also been great to teach some Polish PhD students and get new perspectives on how uh, we learn as academics. And we've been really fortunate to have a series of publications. Uh, I've published three articles from the project so far, and now together with Professor Chaya, I'm editing a uh, Oxford University Press volume with research findings uh, from the whole group of people who were involved in the Harmonia Network grant before the Olam project. And we won the right to publish that uh, through a competition with the British Academy. So it was really great to be in this sort of small percentage of people who are successful with that. Uh, there have been some challenges. Uh, the UK has a different grant scheme than most of Europe, not surprisingly. The Britain always seems to have to be different. Um, but it was quite difficult to negotiate the time away from my home university to be here. Uh, I can explain what those problems are in questions at the end, if, if anyone likes. Uh, COVID-19 has caused some library and archive closures, which have delayed our research a bit. But we're still optimistic uh, that we might secure some further funding. Uh, we're hoping also to put in a ERC grant application. To, to make a more systematic survey of medieval ethnic and race law. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, are there any questions, burning questions? If not, we will have a Q&A session after Emmanuel's presentation, so now I would like to welcome to our virtual stage Emmanuel Kuczynski, who is Zekla supervisor, who you can you could see on the Twitter uh, Twitter screenshots before, and he's of course one of the Olam program mentors, and he will share with us his host perspective and why to host an Olam scholarship holder and what are the opportunities and challenges of that. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me uh, here. Uh, my name is uh, Emanuel Kulczycki and I'm the head of Scholarly Communication Research Group. And I would like to share with you in this short presentation uh, some insights and thoughts uh, after having uh, Zekra here in uh, Poznan. Uh, before uh, Zechra applied. Uh, I uh, I did not I did not know her. So as you can see, you can apply for Ulan program just uh, sending a tweet or email someone and ask whether uh, you can go uh, to Poland and work with uh, someone. Uh, as our example shows, uh, this can work uh, perfectly. Uh, let me share uh, with you some uh, words about our group. I think it might be important to understand my perspective on the Ulan program. Uh, in Poznan, we, uh, we constitute uh, an interdisciplinary group. We investigate various science systems, various funding system in research and also research systems. So we look for various inspiring new perspectives. We look for various peoples who can who can teach us with whom we can work together and find uh, new research questions and new research areas uh, and what is very important to us we are a team and we work as a team we support each other and we uh, support each other research project we uh, work from monday to friday we try we try to find a work-life balance we work from uh, 8, 9 a.m. to 3, 4 p.m. We believe it's our work uh, hobby. 
uh, but we have to uh, stay uh, safe and healthy. So this is our group and we are, we are open for other people. And this is why when Zekra wrote to us, we were happy to, uh, to help her with the application to Ulam uh, program because uh, we know that new persons can inspire our research questions and methods we use. We don't know many methods uh, which uh, Zekra used. This is why uh, we call Zekra the master of rainbows because her visualizations are really great and inspire our understanding of research we do. Uh, we want to learn more about research systems in other countries. So having Zekra and other researchers here is a great opportunity for us. Uh, we know that establishing new relations uh, with other research groups, uh, it's not only good for us now, but it will be very uh, fruitful uh, in the future. And uh, last but not least, uh, working with new people is just a lot of fun. It's really great to have Zekra in Poznan here. And uh, we see how it benefits not only Zekra, but it benefits all of us, uh, all our uh, members of uh, our group. So what are the benefits from the host perspective? So firstly, Zekra brings a lot of positive energy that inspire us. It's really important when you can uh, go to your office and you see people you like, work with, uh, you see people who can inspire you. It's very important in a daily uh, work routine. Uh, what is also important that new research ideas that were neither in uh, Zekra's uh, project nor on our agenda, agenda were developed and we are creating new projects. Uh, for our younger colleagues, our MA and PhD students, it is important that English is our, uh, the language of everyday communication. It's important when uh, students, especially now during uh, COVID-19 era, cannot attend uh, in-person international conferences. So having people from Ulan program here, it's beneficial for them. And we built a friendship that will stay after uh, the project is over. So this, this, these are uh, huge benefits for uh, our group. And of course, there are no uh, negative sides, but from the host perspective, there are some administrative challenges. And when some of you are thinking about uh, coming uh, to Poland of you uh, considering being the host, you have to uh, think also about some challenges. So firstly, I would like to emphasize that Zekra always highlights excellent contact with NAVA. On this ground, there are no issues. Also, uh, there are no issues between university and uh, NADA. One of the challenges for me uh, as uh, the host of the uh, ULAM program uh, scholarship holder is that Zekra is not employee of the university. It's not uh, an issue resulting from NADA regulation, but the culture embodied in our university. So when there is an issue of of building access and I have to write some documents. I cannot say Zekra is employee. Uh, it's not a huge uh, challenge, but from my perspective, a few such things can uh, build some annoying administrative burden, which must uh, be fixed. Uh, Zekra is uh, a visiting professor. She is, but officially in the light of university regulations, she is not because she has no official teaching load. So it also uh, creates some tensions, but it's also, uh, it, I would like to emphasize this, it's not for the, the whole Poland, it's for one of universities. Uh, however, all of these issues are not important when I compare them to the benefits uh, of having Zekra here. I have no doubt that being a host is a great opportunity and those minor issues are not important in the uh, big picture. So this is why uh, I'm really happy there is a next call for uh, ULA program. We, this is why we created also a special uh, page on our 
website group. Once again, we are looking for researchers who want to uh, work with us. We believe it's not only a great program for uh, researchers who would like to come to Poland, but it's also a great program for research groups uh, established in Poland and uh, which work in Poland to develop uh, themselves. So this is my highly and extremely positive experience uh, after one and a half year of being a host of Zekras project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, so many times there are references to Zekra's rainbows. I would love to see one of them. <laughs> um, so now we can begin our Q&A session with all the speakers. So if anyone has any questions about the Ulam program or the living in Poland, anything you would like to ask now it's the time for it so if you want to there is a raise hand option i believe it shows up once you click on the participants list then i will ask to ask you to unmute and you can ask your question yourself if you could just at the beginning state where you're from and, and who you're addressing your question to or just type the question on the chat so i can read it to the speakers Okay, we have the first question um, from Joanna. I'm asking to unmute. Hello, Joanna. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Joanna Kwiatek. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Rutgers University in the US. And I have three questions to Madame Kowalczyk, if I may. So my very first question is, did you mention that uh, applicant is required to present three achievements? And I'm wondering, do all of them need to be from different categories or all of them can be from one category, like for example, three papers? Yes, you, you can have three publications or uh, three monographs. It usually depends on the discipline, yes? Okay. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. The another question is sort of like um, also to you, but uh, it lead me from the presentation of uh, Emmanuel. Uh, so is the recipient of the program employed by the host institution or by the NAVA? Mm. Uh, the, the fellow is not employed by, uh, you know, anybody. <laughs> because the person uh, gets money from the NAVA, from NAVA agency as a scholarship. The money is transferred to his or him account directly. The person uh, doesn't pay any taxes and this person can be employed by university, but it depends on agreement between uh, fellow and university. Uh, so pretty much if the person received money is just have money for the salary yes this is like salary this is like salary else. there is no money for research and and for any travels and other expenses so you have money to to live here and for flat and and life and also does the recipient have an access to the health insurance and the paid leave does it or does it come from the scholarship and what about the retirement plan okay the fellow has to pay insurance by himself okay and so and also the program doesn't include uh, the holiday season uh, you can be outside of the uh, of the university 10 percent of your time so 10% of two years or one year is like your holidays. So you, you can uh, discuss this with your supervisor that you prefer, you know, one month uh, go to family or, or to other country, yeah, or small. And, and also the, the scholarship doesn't include any, any portion of it which would be dedicated for the retirement plan. 
No, no, nothing. Okay, so it's just like this like ten thousand dollar, uh, ten thousand yes. uh, zloty, not dollars. <laughs> which only which is... on, only for this time you are here, okay. and there is no special money for future or for. Or for... Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your question and your answers. I see Emmanuel has raised hand. Um, Yes, because I would like to add something. Uh, it might be important for Joanna uh, and also other persons. It's uh, the perspective of the host, but all questions addressed by uh, Joanna are, uh, I would say, from the same area. So uh, from the um, legal perspective, uh, there is almo almost no connection between scholarship holder and the university, actually. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Zekra, has no contact with the university in terms of uh, um, salary, uh, health insurance. Actually, she's like outside the whole system. So the only contact with the institution is me. So I decide about everything. It's not because I would like to do uh, all decisions, but actually from the university, there is university, there is a scholarship holder, there is NAVA and when university signed the document that uh, university will host a scholarship holder, there is a person designated that is host in this example, in this case, me, uh, who have to decide about everything. So uh, this 10% of uh, time outside the university uh, and actually everything. So when you come to Poland, you have to uh, using money from another scholarship cover uh, health insurance. Uh, there is no taxes from the scholarship. So it's, uh, it's um, the amount of money as Zekra mentioned is uh, absolutely enough to, uh, to live here in, um, uh, in, uh, in Poland. But you have to remember that there is no legal connection between you and the university. What makes some troubles at the very beginning, uh, especially at the university. So everything is said legally, but uh, people at institutions sometimes cannot understand how it is possible that we have a grant of the Na from the NAVA, but there is no contract between the university and the scholarship holder. Probably after two or three more years, uh, everything will be understood uh, more clearly at the universities, but now it might, mm, it might make some uh, challenges at the very beginning in the institution in which there was uh, no uh, uh, scholarship holders from NAVA previously. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, Matthew, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, I would only like to stress that I had exactly the same situation at Copernicus University. And uh, this is something you need to think about with respect to your home university. Uh, for example, uh, my university in Wales uh, insisted that Copernicus University sign a collaboration agreement to indicate that I would be working at Copernicus University and that was demanded by my home university in Wales and, and my home university could not understand the concept that my host university would not sign a letter acknowledging that I was there uh, and uh, so the, it's not only a, a difficult situation with respect to the university in Poland but equally for your home university uh, you know, because, for example, from the UK, if a scholar has a fellowship like the NAVA fellowship, your pension continues to be paid by your home university in the UK. But they can't do that without confirmation that you're really working somewhere else. And so it, it's, it's important to think about both ends, how your home university will understand the time away as well. Thank you. Um, Joanna, I saw you asked the question on the chat, but... Oh. Yeah, just, just to follow up, uh, because yeah, this concept is like very difficult to, to understand. So 
the first question is in case of any accident which would happen during the work uh, at the university uh, who is taking any responsibility for the recipient i address this question directly to, to the director of my university on the uh, meeting devoted only to ask this specific question and the rector replied that the university because there is a contract between nava and the university uh, okay so but i must admit i don't understand this but i addressed so... this question directly to the university before zekra started to work so uh but then i guess it's it's not really regulated so every host institution might have different regulation it might be unfortunately i can't I okay can't so it's not specified and and then what what matthew you also just mentioned which for me it was also not very clear so you sort of took leave from your welsh university to come to poland so you were officially employed in the uk and but you came for those two years to poland to do your project is it correct that's correct and my home university has to hold my post open so that i could return um uh, but that puts a certain financial burden on my home university in terms of things like pension payments and so in in fact they lose money uh while i'm here so so it, it's it was very very difficult uh, America, I think, operates generally on the same system as the UK, which is if you have a fellowship at a foreign university, if you have a fellowship, the, the money from the fellowship goes to the home university uh, to compensate them for your absence. But that cannot happen with the NAVA scheme, which is it's very problematic for the UK, I imagine, for the US too. So, uh, but maybe, maybe, um... Madam Kowalczyk can clarify that you actually do not need to be employed by the other university. You can just get the SNAVA stipend and go to the to Poland to a host institution. You don't need to have a pre-employment overseas. Is it correct? Uh, you must to have pre-employment and because uh, we really want people who are still, uh, you know, in in science, they work. Uh, um, but the employment is not required uh, when you received PhD after August 22. Yeah, okay. So like but if you your have a doctoral PhD is, is, is older, you need to show some um, proof that you work recently or you finished uh, some employment or postdoctoral fellow after August 2020. Yeah, so but it's just a matter of the experience. It's not the matter that you you have to show that after uh, after the time of the ULAM program finishes, you have a place to go back. No, no, no. Nothing okay, like yes. This. Thank you so much for all the questions. That's all for me. Uh, thank you. In the meanwhile, we got a couple of questions in the chat. First one is um, that I saw from Osula, Osula. Osulale Olainka. I'm so sorry if I, and I probably did mispronounce that. Uh, I saw somewhere no money for research. Please explain. I believe this is for Magdalena Kowal. Yes. I, I explained this during the presentation that we don't um, give any money for research, for conference, materials, travels, and everything like this. We give something like salary. It is transferred to directly to fellow second, and and there is no money for institution, no indirect money. So the the all expenses have to be supported by institution uh, or by supervisor, um, any money project money, something like this. Thank you. In and oh, sorry. 10% uh, period outside the host institution, we must count holiday, but also, for example, field works. I already explained that, that everything what is related to the project, like field works, conferences, uh, you know, visits in other laboratories, is included into the 90% because it's related to the project. 10% is 
you know, only for your family reasons and your personal reasons. Okay. That recording will be shared. Yes, will be shared. Yes, yes, we'll share. Oh, Kasia, uh, uh -huh. Kasia Makowska has a raised hand. You could. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for all the presentations and perspectives. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I have a more general question to, to Zehra and to Matthew mostly. Um, I'm uh, curious to hear about your experience of uh, living in Poland and maybe a bit outside of work. Just um, has it been, well, I guess the, the biggest unexpected thing would be the pandemic. But in general, what, how, what has the experience been like for you? Is there anything that surprised you or any any tips for, for people who might be coming to, to live in Poland like you? I can start if it's okay. Um, I lived in a city, uh, capital city of Turkey for 25 years. It, in, it is, its population is 8 million people. After Ankara, uh, living in Poznan is really great for me. It's like a holiday because <laughs> it's so small city. <laughs> I'm going to office walking and uh, I my house next to the forest. Everything is great. Uh, and unfortunately we have coronavirus things and schools are closed, but uh, my son's schools continue with the online education system. And uh, I think, um, for me, after living in a crowded city with a lot of traffic and everything, so it's good to live in a small city for me. I, I can say this. Um, well, I'm not sure what I could add to that. Uh, Torun, very similarly, is a small city, and it, it's just a very a nice atmosphere. I find that, uh, generally speaking, uh, Polish people are now are, are quite open. And when I was first in Torun uh, 11 years ago, I was in Torun for six months. And uh, at that time, uh, I did not speak Polish then, and it, it could be quite difficult. Uh, but now the younger generation, everyone below the age of 20, say, has learned some English uh, in school. Uh, young people are often very keen, even when I speak Polish, to, to speak back to me in English as soon as they hear my accent. And, and so it's actually, it's a much easier environment to come to and live in than it was just 10 years ago. I, uh, the bureaucracy is very heavy. I think it took me four months to complete the registration for my motorcycle. <laughs> After four trips to the Vigil Communicatia, <laughs> this is just life in, in Poland. But don't worry about it. The bureaucracy is slow and heavy, but it's also quite civilized. And generally, people have always treated me very well. Thank you. Yes, Poland is known for its <laughs> bureaucracy, unfortunately. Um, are there any more questions to our speakers? Oh, we do, from Tabish. Uh, what percentage of successful applicants have a simultaneous job in their home country? And what percentage leave their previous job when entering the NAVA? You know, I don't really have this data because we we don't ask that you are still employed in your institution yeah we only employ we ask that you were employed during the application time so i don't know i only have from some people from just emails that they have still job in in their country and i think we can guess this information from the period of time uh, when when I are here, yeah, because when somebody is coming for six months, probably is going back to, to, to his or him country. But many of application is for 24 months and it's 
you know, I'm sure really that they come here and they are going maybe to stay here because this is like the next step in, in their career and they're going to apply for some grants in Poland. Thank you, Zekre, would you like to add something? Uh, I want to add this because uh, I had a permanent job in Turkey. I worked as assistant professor and I get one year unpaid leave, but I don't know the regulation that the regulation in Turkey is like, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have your uh, regular job in six years, you cannot get second extra year for unpaid leave. So I had to resign from my job. It's not a problem for me, but uh, sometimes it, it might be a problem for the other researcher. I suggest uh, uh, candidates uh, to check their country's regulations before applied to the grants, because there are some weird decisions or weird reg regulations from uh, higher education systems of their countries and their uh, their uh, higher education systems. Thank you. Um, so with this question, I think we will uh, we'll finish, wrap up this webinar. Um, I would like to thank so much to, to our speakers and the participants for, for such a beautiful turnout. And I would just like to mention that in May, we'll have another webinar uh, joined with NAVA about other programs. It will be sometime at the end of May. The information will follow on Facebook and our website. So if you are interested, please follow us. I would also want to, I also would like to encourage you to sign up to our Polonium Foundation's web, sorry, newsletter, in which we also write about uh, some relevant programs and give updates about all our webinars. And if you would like to connect with some researchers, Polish researchers working abroad or other researchers working in Poland, we really encourage you to sign up for Polonium Network. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming and see you at the next webinar. Have a beautiful evening or day wherever you are. <laughs>